for some unknown reason to me, people seem to look down on fishing with floats. Or at best, maybe they look at it as something that, you know, it's, it's good for the first part of the season. But in my opinion, slip bobbers are a solid option that can save you time, can save you energy, and can save you a lot of money and bait. I want to go over three things. What kind of gear do you need? Where and how is the best way to fish for walleyes with a slip bobber? And lastly, the basics of setting up your line and leader. Now there's some videos out there that would like you to believe that you need thousands of dollars worth of electronics, side imaging, or live imaging, or an eight foot, $300 fishing rod specially made just for bobber fishing in order to catch walleyes. Now in my opinion, all you need is some basic walleye knowledge and a garage sale graphite, and you're gonna do just fine. Now let's start with the actual setup itself. What I go with is a six foot six medium rod with a fast action on the tip. Now, you can go as expensive or cheap as you want with this. For a bobber rod, I think $50 is plenty to spend on a rod. And if you can get it at a garage sale for 25, why not? Now, if you want to spend more, I guess what I would say is the easiest way to do this is just have a an extra jigging rod that's one of your nice versions in the boat with you at all times, but set up with a slip bobber system. Whenever I get in the boat to fish for walleyes, I have three rods. I'm gonna have this six foot six, medium power, fast action jigging rod, which would be around the St. Croix variety, and this is gonna be set up for jigging specifically. So either vertically jigging or pitching jigs. Then I'm gonna have the same type of unit, six foot six, medium power, fast action uh, jigging rod, but instead I'm gonna have it set up with a slip bobber. And then thirdly, although this is currently set up for the first slip bobber, I'm going to have about a six foot six or a seven foot medium light power fast, extra fast action. And this is going to be more of a slow trolling rod, Lindy rigs, that type of thing. It's an extra sensitive so you can really feel everything, but quite a bit less backbone. And so depending on how we're how we're finding the fish, we're usually gonna start with either jigging or trolling. But once we've located the fish, we're gonna give that bobber a try because he just might find out that that's the most effective and efficient way to catch them. Now, like I said, if you want, you can have a six foot six, medium power, fast action, St. Croix rod set up with a bobber, and it's gonna do great, but that's gonna cost you probably 100 to 150 these days. But if you're like me, you might not wanna spend that much. Now. Like I said, a garage sale graphite. This guy is a Shimano Convergence. It's called a Worm and Wiggle. Like I said, six foot six medium power, fast action. And what is the difference? What's gonna be that difference between this kind of a jigging rod and that St. Croix variety? So the main difference to me is the consistency of the backbone, all right? When you have that St. Croix rod, you can feel that consistency from the, the handle all the way to the tip. When you are jigging, you can feel that that tip is responding to everything you're doing with your hand. Where on these cheaper varieties, it almost feels like the backbone ends somewhere around here. Although I know that that's not accurate, that's not true, but something goes on on the end where there's a lot more wobble, there's less control. And you can tell when you're jigging, you'll see that end of your rod just kind of going like that. It's, it's like a leg effect when you're jigging with your hand and the end is kind of slowly uh, behind. Now, for jigging, that's not optimal. You don't have that quick response set. But for bobber fishing, it's just fine. You still have enough sensitivity where you can feel the fish on the end, which is exactly what you want. You wanna be able to feel the fish as you're reeling down. It's gonna load up first on that tip and it's just gonna be ever so subtle and if you can just start to feel that it's loading up, you know that that fish is on, then you can reel down and let the rest of the rod set the hook for you. You don't have to give a big cranking you know, set on this. You can give a little bit sometimes when I reel down, I'm letting that rod set it, and then I'll give it just another, maybe, you know, just to make sure that that's in. But if you have, let's say, uh, a regular St. Croix rod, that's gonna be just fine you're still gonna have just as much sensitivity on the end, it's just a better rod. And I'm just saying you don't have to spend that if you don't want to on a bobber rod. Okay, so now let's go to the setup itself. We're gonna have this line, this thread, 
that is the bobber stop itself. Then we have the bead, okay? The bead will stop right at that thread. Then we have the bobber, and this is a fill bobber, and this is one of the lighter walleye bobbers. Then we're gonna have what I have here is a number 10 swivel. I'm using split shots. And then I'm using another swivel clip. So it's a swivel and a fast clip. And then I have on there a Tom's Tackle defrost. And uh, if, if any of you uh, actually watch a lot of my videos, you'll know that I use this a lot. And that's usually because I'm fishing a lot of lakes that are cloudy or stained. They're darker lakes and this shows up real nice. Now, if you're fishing a clear lake, I would advise not using this. And I'll go into different options for hooks uh, later. But I will say really, real quick, even though I'm gonna do a whole video on bobbers alone, I wanna talk about why I use this bobber and also this number 10 swivel. Now the number 10 swivel, as you can see, is big enough where when the bobber comes down, it can't, that bobber will not go past that swivel. If this is too small, it might get lodged inside that bobber and then you're casting out and it's getting stuck on something and that's quite annoying. Now this is, like I said, one of the lighter thills and it's really just based upon how much weight and what kind of bait you're gonna use. Now I use either fat heads, leeches, or crawlers. So this is kind of the perfect setup to keep this bobber neutrally buoyant right at that black line in the water. Now, if this was a bigger bobber, I'm going to need more weight or I might have bigger bait, that type of thing. But one of the things that I'm very particular about is having my weights about one foot away from my hook. And this is for two reasons. I want that weight down below rather than up at, at on the top. Because for one, if I do have a minnow, it keeps this minnow from being able to swim too far away. It's kind of kind of hooked and anchored in by these weights. But number two, as a lot of times you will be fishing in areas with a slip bobber where you're using either the current or a drift to come up on a point or up on a shoreline, whatever it might be. And you want to be aware as soon as this bobber starts to lay up, you know that that is starting to drag on the bottom. Now, if you had something where you had a lot of weight, let's say up here, right on the swivel, that you might not notice as much when it starts to ride on the bottom because all the weight's up here. It's going to still keep that bobber vertical. Or if you use one of these guys that has the weight on it, I don't know if you can see that, one of these guys that has the weight there on it, right around there, now that weight is not going to hold this straight up. It's still going to be just like this but it takes less weight to get it down to that spot. And so it's just a little bit more difficult of an indicator when it's starting to lay up on the bottom or if you're fishing deeper water and it's not necessarily a break, a fish is coming up from the bottom and lifting you. So you might be, you, you know, see that kind of go up a little bit. And my whole thing is I want to be tuned in, finely tuned in to this bobber. When you fish slip bobbers enough, you can tell just the most subtle of, of how it's changing. It might be kind of going along, bouncing, and all of a sudden it kind of sets up straight. And you just, you can tell, it's just ever so slight that a fish is on, something's going on down there. And it might not be your traditional walleye downward telescope uh, bite. And so you have to be kind of tuned in. So that is why I like this lighter fill bobber and I like my weights down close to my hook. Okay, so here is the uh, basic hooks that you'd be using on a slip bobber system. Um, this one right here is just about as standard as you can get. Size number two, octopus hook. You're going to be using this for uh, leeches, crawlers, or fat heads. Just of an all-around good fit for slip bobber fishing. Now, this one here, a uh, little bit larger, size one, finesse wide gap. That's a good option if you're going to be using a little bit bigger bait, walleye sucker minnows, I guess they're called. That might be a good option for you. Now, if you're trying to add just a little bit of glow, you know, maybe really deep areas or you are fishing uh, cloudy water or stained water like I do, this uh, VMC Glow Resin might be a good option. Just a 
tiny bit of glow there um, on a real, like I say, standard octopus hook number two. If you're using jigs, this is a wide variety of standard summer jig um, and uh, nothing real fancy to that, but that's a, a, an option. This VMC uh, Moon Eye is also a popular option. Um, it glows, has that nice little eye look, and uh, again, another summer jig option that is good for slip bobber fishing. Now we're getting into the stuff that I tend to use. So the places that I go uh, on a regular basis are stained lakes or cloudy lakes. And therefore I do a lot of Tom's tackle, which is pink gold glow or pink and glow. Um, you know, this Tom's tackle defrost is kind of my uh, all around uh, bait that I use the most. Uh, but all of these are solid options in fishing stained lakes or cloudy lakes. I, I use these whether I'm fishing in five feet of water or 20 feet of water or 25 feet of water. So uh, now Tom's Tackle, you're probably gonna be looking at getting up in the Baudet area to buy, but you can go online and buy these. Uh, if you're interested in Tom's Tackle, please check out their website and uh, you can order straight from there. <clears throat> now, if you don't have Tom's Tackle, you can always just go with your standard Lindy uh, glow jigs. Um, also, if you have like some ice fishing jigs, um, like this, those are going to work just as well. So that's it. That's uh, a lot of the options that you have for um, throwing on that quick clip on a slip bobber system. Okay, like I said, we're going to go over the basic gear, how, when, and where to fish for walleye with slip bobbers. And lastly, we're going to go over how I set up my leader, my hook, my swivels. I'm just going to go through the whole process and hopefully that answers any questions that you might have. So let's say we have a large muddy bay about three to four feet of water. This would not be my first choice to look for walleyes. But now let's imagine that that bay is about 28 to 30 feet deep. It has a rock reef in the middle. And let's also say that that bay has a couple points that slowly recede down to the 28 foot depth. Even with a couple weed beds, we're gonna assume that the bottom is mainly sand and rock. Now let's open this up to the big lake so that this has a consistent current water flow throughout this bay. Also this freshwater inlet providing an abundance of life for this reed point. Now let's imagine that you're marking several fish here at the base of this rock reef. With the wind coming from this direction, a strong option would be drifting this rock reef, bouncing jigs off the bottom. But in doing this, you'd be wasting lots of time and energy going back and forth, back and forth, only to hit one spot. But parking the boat upwind and letting the bobber drift your jig towards the rock reef is a far more efficient and effective way to fish this location. Same line of thought applied here at this reed point. This summer we trolled this reed point several times and located one spot where we continued to find fish. Identifying that the fish were piled up here, depth transitioned from 10 feet to 7 feet. So with the wind coming from this direction, we once again part the boat and switch to bobbers, allowing our lures to gently drift to this prime location. Another example of where drifting bobbers might be more efficient and effective is here on this rocky shoreline. Although we were very successful picking up fish on this rocky shoreline, bouncing jigs off the bottom, we also lost a lot of jigs and time getting snagged up, parking the boat in spot lock and allowing our lures to drift just above the tops of the rocks, allowed the fish to see the bait without getting the snags. Okay, so let's go ahead and set one of these up. What are you gonna need if you're doing it the good enough angler way? So here's some things I will use the fill uh, premium bobber stops and you know what I've used generic stuff in the past I actually think there's a difference and I'm not here to sell you things As a matter of fact I'm here to do the opposite I'm here to save you money but uh, I go with the, the fill premium bobber stops every time like I said before I'm gonna go with that size 10 barrel swivel and I'm gonna use this number five now I like to have a variety of split shots because like I said, I'm gonna be going all over the place. Uh, if I change my jig, I wanna have that neutral buoyancy. 
So I'm going to be changing up the weights as well to match it up. And then finally, I'm going to be having some fluorocarbon. Now this is 14 pound and you might think, well, that's a little bit much, don't you think? It probably is. 10 pound fluorocarbon is probably just fine, but this is what I had, so I used it. Now I'm going to go with this dual lock swivel snap. Oh, and the other thing you're going to need, if you're like me, you're going to need a pair of readers. If you're around, you know, your 30s or something, you don't have to worry about that yet. But when you're old like me, you're going to need all the help you can get. Okay, so the first thing that you're going to be putting on is the bobber stop. And so that would mean the threaded part before the bead. The bead is going to slide up the line just on top of the bobber. Once that bead hits the bobber stop, the threaded bobber stop, it will hold that bobber in place. So for those of you who are asking, this would be eight pound mono. Again, lots of people will use different things. They might use braided, they might go heavier on the mono. It is what I had. Make sure you slide this thread off the top so that you can bring that plastic off the bottom. Now, it could be that even if you tied it, you might be able to get that plastic over there. You probably could. No, nope, you probably could. So even if you mess that up, you can still get the plastic off. Some people will cut these really short and some people will leave them very long. I am a middleman. I go right in the middle and there is a specific reason for that. When they are long like this, I have had it many, many times catch on these guides. And there's nothing more annoying than that thread getting caught on that line as you're trying to cast out and watching your bait go flying off the hook and into the water. Especially if you're trying to cut down on uh, wasting bait. So what I like to do is give it just about this much. So I'd say that that's a full inch and a half. So it's enough hanging off that you're not going to be using the very tips of your fingers to try to grab that line and pull it down if you're trying to. And you will have to retighten this from time to time because otherwise it will go sliding around on you. And you know, you'll be reeling in and a lot of times it'll hit the top. It'll hit the top right up here and then it'll, it'll hold on because you got that tension with the fish on and it'll slide down. And if you tighten it too tight, if you cinch it up too tight, then each time that you pull that thing down, you're going to be pulling so hard that you're risking damaging the line. You're risking damaging that mono or, you know, with mono it's going to, it, it has the tendency to curl up and you're going to curl that up or like I said, you might get your fingernail in there and you're damaging it. Now, that could be an argument for why you might go with braided. Uh, and I go with mono, so I'm just really darn careful when I'm moving that uh, bobber stop around. Okay, so then the next part is your bead. And you know, you just gotta move it around until you find that hole, which I don't think I'm gonna see on my camera. And then of course you just slide it nice through, pull that down, and your next part is your bobber. Now there's a variety, a large variety of bobbers out there. And again, this is the fill that I go with. It's one of the smallest fills out there. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. It's one of the smaller walleye fills out there. And uh, as you can say, see, I've kind of got it littered with some uh, plastic. And uh, these are actually rubber bands for braces. And that works for my lighted setup. So I want those on first. But I'm not going to get into all the details about bobbers on this one because I'm doing two separate videos on bobbers that will be coming soon. So you slide that through the top and come out that end. I'm trying to use this black, hopefully, it, and slide it down. And then the next thing you're going to be doing is putting on that number 10 barrel swivel. Now again, what kind of knots you choose, that's going to be up to you. This uh, from the mono onto the barrel swivel, I'm just going with a fisherman's knot. At least that's what I've been taught it's called. Maybe it's called something different. But I do bring the line through twice. I honestly don't know why. I mean, a little added security for me. And so, you know, this is just about as basic knot as you can get. Put your, your thumb and forefinger over that barrel swivel. Bring it around eight or nine times, or 10, whatever. This has not been the knot 
part of the knot that's uh, usually concerning me. Never had this fall off or break off with a fish. You know, you goob it up a little bit and then you pull that down, grab that barrel swivel and let it go the rest of the way. Just like that. And then we'll just take off that tag end. Biddly do. Okay, now this is probably the more important part. This is the fluorocarbon. Let's go ahead and tie that fluorocarbon knot. And uh, I've had a little bit more trouble with the fluorocarbon knots. And basically the trouble is a freaking memory. If you get this one off, it'll break. It'll cinch down on itself, which I've done several times, and just break. And so I like to make sure that I, uh, I gave it a good few tests, making sure that I did it right before uh, I threw it out in the water. That's the last thing I want to do is have my incompetence get in the way of landing a fish. All right, so this is one where you're basically looping, trying to get a loop like that through the eye of this and because this barrel swivel is so big it actually isn't that hard but the other way to do it so that was just putting the whole loop through the other way to do it it's just, just as easy is to go through once pull in some line and just go back through again. Now, for the sake of this video, and I'm really hoping I can get this, did this before and it didn't come out so well, for the sake of this video, I will kind of use an extra amount of line. So, once you get that loop all the way through, you bring the loop over, so you're making a nice big circle here. So I'm going to go under this and then around, okay? One, two, three. And then we're just going to go back through. As you can see, there's that loop that was created with the double loop where my thumb and forefinger were. Sometimes at this point I bite that down, just so I don't bite it down, I just pull it a little bit tighter so it's easier to pull through. So as you can see I'm pulling that through the loop. And once I have that end, I'm going to pull that down just a little bit to get some tightness. So I got the one loop through, I've got the main line that's going to be my leader line, and then the tag end. And now is when you want to moisten this a little bit. And then you can cinch that down. And we're ready to roll. So now we're going to have to cut off this guy and then cut off the tag end. Make sure you don't cut off the main line. Now I don't fiddle about too much with that guy because the name good enough came from a reason. All right, so now how long the leader's gonna be at the end of all things I want it to be about three feet, but I'm going to give myself a lot more room to tie that knot because to me it's helpful to have that extra to play with to make those loops big enough where I can see them. So I'm going to pull out about four and a half, five feet of line, maybe four feet of line. I'm not really counting, I'm just docking right now. I'm going to grab that barrel swivel, which is much smaller. The barrel swivel and the snap are much on the snap is much smaller than obviously the barrel swivel 
the number 10. <clears throat> so this one, there's no way I'm going to be able to get that loop through. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that line through twice. Like that. And then we're going to bring it back through. Like that. Go ahead and pull more of that out. And just like I showed on the other one. Okay, so it's underneath, so you're going over the top one. Go over the top. Two. Three. Gonna pull that down with my teeth a little bit. As you can see, got those loops. We're bringing that single loop through the double loop. You can't hear that, but there's a deer walking right over there, and two fawns are coming behind her. Okay, and then you're gonna goob this up and cinch it down. There we are. Nice and tight. And then we're just going to be trimming off. We're going to be just trimming off that loop and tag end. Boy, they are. <laughs> it's fun to live out here. Now somehow I messed up this piece. All right, so let's go ahead and cut off that loop and tag end. Okay. So now you've got the end of your barrel swivel where you got your barrel swivel and your quick clip. And so I'm going to go ahead and throw on my go-to bait for the, or my go-to jig for the ones, for the places that I usually fish, which is my Tom's Tackle Defrost. I know, crazy, right? And you know, some people are gonna be worried about this being seen. Um, hasn't been an issue, it just hasn't been an issue, so. I am not worried. What did I end up with for a... Oh boy, look at that. That's about three feet. Dang. Alright, number five. And typically, for my bobber setup and the fill that I use, along with, along with the jig that I use, I'm going to use two of these to get that neutrally buoyant. I'm going to use two of those to get that neutrally buoyant. So. I'm going to go just a little bit more than a foot. Okay. So there we go. A little over a foot. Two split shots, number five, on a 14 pound chlor fluorocarbon leader that could be 10 and it would be just fine. It's just what I had around. And that is my full setup for my six foot six medium powered, cheap as all get out rod. 8 pound mono, which I would say 10 is probably good or just fine. My smaller thill, but I would say smaller uh, walleye thill with the number 10 swivel, 14 pound, uh, 3 foot of possibly, that could be 4 feet. Yeah, I, I went a little bit too much. I got 4 feet there, but that's all right. 4 feet, 3 to 4 feet of uh, fluorocarbon leader. This is 14, but you'd be just fine with 10. Then that small, smaller barrel swivel, swivel sw slash clip, and then that Tom's Tackle defrost. And I showed you all the varieties. There are so many different varieties that you could use to put on there. And again, it's going to be your preference. You can tie 
right onto the jig and that's going to give a much firmer presentation if that's something that is concerning to you. The part that I don't like about that is because I like to change things up a bit. As you can see on this one, it is tied directly to that jig. This is, uh, we were using this to cast into the shallows. And this leader is now about six inches long. So if you're trying to change up your jig, then each time that you change that jig, you're getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And now you're down to a six inch and I have to retie the whole thing. And this knot right here, I believe this is the FG knot, super awesome knot from going from braided to mono is just much more difficult to tie so I would much rather have that swivel and quick snap on the bottom so there you go that's how I set up my good enough slip bobber rod